This talk is about uh, the Memory Access API, which is a new API which uh, we added as an incubating API to Java 14 just as the gate was coming crashing down. So basically on the la very last day. And um, the title of this talk is uh, Deliberately Inflammatory. I hope that by the end of this talk I will have convinced you that uh, the role of the new Memory Access API is not to completely replace the ByBuffer API, you can decide whether you want to use the new API with byte buffers or if you want to completely replace byte buffer usage with the new memory API. So it's up to you. Hopefully you will have a, yet another tool in the toolbox that will help your work. So usual disclaimer, don't believe a word I say. So there are a number of uh, situations as to why people may want to reach for off it memory. Probably the primary one is to avoid all the costs associated with GC. Now we have uh, Shenandoah, we have ZGC, so we have much better GC than we did in the past, but still there are cases where, uh, for example, when you want to do a real-time application, you may just want to en entirely avoid GC poses. There are also other uh, circumstances where using off memory may be necessary. For example, when you want to share memory across multiple processes, or when you want to share memory with a native library. So it's not a, uh, an accident that we landed on this API when we were working on Project Panama, which is, as Mark showed before, all about kind of native interop. The Java de facto API for using this kind of, uh, of heap access is the byte buffer API. There are also other APIs hidden in the JDK. Uh, come uh, uh, misconceive is, uh, some misconceive is one of those. You can use that if you want. It's fast, but it's unsafe. So if the VM comes crashing down, it's your fault. What about byte buffers? Well, byte buffers were added in uh, Java 1.4, so they were part of the big push uh, towards uh, buffer-oriented uh, input-output. They are a rich and stateful API, and the main one of the main drivers of byte buffer was to uh, make it simple for you to write idiomatic I/O code. So it has a lot of state internally that allows you to prevent buffer overruns and underruns, uh, helps you with things like uh, char set encoding and decoding. And uh, by buffer, crucially, can be allocated both on the Java heap, but also off the Java heap. So you can actually allocate a, a slice of off memory and associate it with a byte buffer. This is like a very typical example of uh, byte buffer usage. Basically, we want to read the contents of a file channel into a byte buffer, and then we want to do a loop to read all the characters that we've read uh, from the buffer. So uh, when we allocate the buffer, the buffer will be empty at the beginning. Uh, two notable things. We have quite a bit of variables here. There is a position, which is initially set to zero, and then there is a capacity, which is essentially how big this buffer is. In this case, it's 10 bytes. And then there is a limit, which is another mutable uh, part of the state of the byte buffer, which will be initially set to the, to, to the capacity. The first thing we have to do is, well, we have to read some stuff from the channel, which means that we are actually writing into the byte buffer. So uh, here we read some characters, and now we have to start uh, reading them into, uh, in our application. So the first thing that we have to do is to flip the buffer from writing mode into reading mode, which means the position here will be set to zero, and the limit will be set to the maximum, uh, basically, to, 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 to the position after the last uh, character that has been read. So I can start doing my loop and uh, read all the characters one by one until eventually we'll uh, end up in a state where the position is identical to the limit. In this case, the predicate as remaining will return false, which means I will go out of my loop, and then I have to get ready for yet another read from the file channel. So I have to call clear. And what does clear do? Well, it will basically reset the state of the byte buffer to the initial state. So position will go back to zero, the limit will go back to the capacity value. And so I can do another iteration. And that's basically how you work with buffers. Of course, uh, if you wanted to, th this is a buffer that is allocated on heap. If you wanted to uh, use a buffer off heap, you just change a single line of the code here, use the allocate direct instead of uh, using the allocate method. So this is called a direct buffer and is associated with off heap memory. 
So with direct buffer, we actually have a new weapon as developers because we can uh, write uh, code uh, that uh, allows us to access off of memory. Access to off of memory with byte buffer is quite efficient because uh, at the end of the day, byte buffer is implemented on top of unsafe. So we can still get advantage of all the C2 uh, data movement intrinsics that we have. The access is also safe because, as we've seen, the byte buffer have all this uh, concept of capacity, limit, position. So every access will be within the boundaries of the byte buffer. Otherwise, we will get uh, uh, an exception. But how good are uh, byte buffers if we want to write general kind of off heap? Uh, programs. Well, let's try to look at some numbers, right? Here I have a benchmark, which is essentially allocating a slab of memory, uh, 400 <laughs> bytes, and then is uh, setting uh, 100 ints inside this uh, big slab of memory. Uh, the benchmark has been kind of cherry-picked because I think this benchmark is characteristic of what happens a lot when you do native interop, which is something that we care a lot uh, when we do Panama. So you allocate a small buffer of memory, you fill it, and then you have to pass a pointer to this memory to maybe some uh, native function, and then you have to free the memory after the function uh, returns. So this is maybe not a, a, a use case that comes up a lot when you're doing I.O., but this is something that you do quite typically when working with uh, native libraries. So if you use unsafe, you get a certain throughput, so nine operation per microsecond, that's fine. Let's try to replace this code by using the byte buffer API, which is a supported API. We can see that the throughput is almost yeah, 9x uh, slower compared to unsafe. This is due to the extra safety that the byte buffer API provides, but it's also due to a number of extra factors. Here we can see that there are at least two factors that are hindering performances. The first is that I'm using the relative positioning scheme, so I, I do a put int. And I'm basically relying on that mutable position field that will be incremented on every axis. And uh, that slows things down a little bit. But the second and most important thing is that every byte buffer has to be registered with a GC cleaner for the office memory to be al uh, de allocated after we can uh, prove that the byte buffer is no longer referenced by uh, anything in our application. And uh, basically, the GC has to do a lot of work here. And this work shows up in the benchmark. In fact, if we uh, change the, the benchmark a little bit, first, to use the absolute put-int method, and secondly, more importantly, to use the unsafe invoke cleaner method, which actually allows us to free the memory uh, explicitly without relying on the GC cleaner, we see that the performance rise uh, a little bit. It's not as fast as unsafe but it's a little bit better. To be fair here uh, to this benchmark and to byte buffer in general, uh, unsafe doesn't zero memory. Byte buffer do zero memory. I'm not allocating a very big uh, chunk of memory here, so zeroing is not uh, affecting performances too much, but still there is an extra cost here when using byte buffer. Uh, and let's look at what happens in memory. So. With unsafe, of course, the GC is basically not working. Uh, all, all the access are unsafe, the, 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 are of heap, and that's basically what you would expect. But with the first byte buffer example that we wrote, so just the naive uh, byte buffer usage, the GC was actually spinning for five seconds during this benchmark, which is quite a lot, considering that you wanted to use uh, off heap memory to get rid of the GC in the first place. With the third benchmark, so this new version, things get a little bit more under control, and the GC time goes back to zero. But still, the performance is not quite as good as it could be. And the biggest problem here is that byte buffer allocate direct. That first invocation is quite heavy, because uh, the byte buffer has to be registered with a cleaner, even if we are not using the cleaner anyway. And also, there is uh, quite a complex state in order to track how much off heap memory we are using. There is a limit, so there are a couple of uh, atomic instructions in order to check whether we are uh, allocating too much. Uh, and so this is quite expensive, and it shows up in this particular uh, allocation-intensive benchmark. So uh, where does this leave the byte buffer API? Is this a bad API? No, it's not a bad API. Uh, it's just that here, we are, I think we are trying to use it in a way that wasn't the way in which white buffer was meant, were meant to be used at the beginning. Uh, 
uh, di direct buffer work very well if you allocate, for example, a very big direct buffer and then you keep sharing it. And also because uh, the cost of IO operation typically dominates every other cost, all the stuff that I show you before doesn't really matter, right? Unfortunately, though, by buffer fail to scale when considering kind of more general cases because uh, you have no way to deterministically release the memory. So you're basically either rely on the GC or you use some unsafe operation in order, but, but you still pay a lot up front in order to allocate the buffer. And then you, then you have the two gigabyte limit, which is starting to hurt, especially now that we have support for mapping persistent memory files. So a persistent memory can probably be a little bit bigger than two gigabytes, and uh, we have no way to access it using the by buffer API because all the indices that we can specify are essentially ints. And then there, is a, there are limitations with the expressiveness of this API when it comes to accessing uh, the memory because we can either choose between sequential access, so essentially one int at a time, or uh, another absolute addressing scheme where I have to pass the offset all the time. There's no support for uh, structured access. So if I have uh, a struct in memory, there's no way for me to say I want to access that particular field. I have to work uh, offset uh, manually in order to get to this or that location into memory. So we think that rather than investing more on the byte buffer API, the time has actually come to build a new memory API from the ground up. And of course this new API will be interoperable with byte buffer, so you don't have to throw away all your code. But uh, as I was discussing with Paul last week, we think that byte buffer have reached uh, their functional capacity. The, some of these limitations, so, such as the two gigabyte limits or the <laughs> deterministic deallocation, are very hard to fix in the current byte buffer API. It will require a pretty big redesign of the entire API, which is probably not going to be very compatible. So uh, it's probably better to, to, to start from scratch and to design a new API here. This is what happens when by buffer kind of fails to meet uh, the expectations. So Net is a big client of byte buffer. It allocates a lot of byte buffer. And uh, starting from version 4, they're all in their own version of uh, byte buffer called byte buff. Uh, no pun intended. And uh, this is based on a different allocation scheme. So they have also a specialized allocator, which reuses memory. So it's an allocation pool. And uh, it's essentially a JE malloc uh, implementation written in Java. And with this, they were able to get a lot more scalability out of their uh, buffer infrastructure. And this is unfortunately something we cannot support in Java today, so people have to reach out for different abstraction. So we'd like that code to come back to the JDK eventually, or at least that's the hope. So enter the memory access API. It's a new API. Uh, it's a safe API, so the goal here, and we will see that later even more, is uh, absolutely no VM crashes. So you should never get a VM crash while trying to access of your memory using this API. It's as safe as by buffer R. There are three key abstractions. The first is called memory segment, which is just a region of memory contiguous bytes somewhere. Uh, they can be on heap or off heap. The, the, the API is actually neutral as to whether the bytes are stored. And uh, then there are, we have addresses, which are essentially offsets into segments. So it's, you can think of it just as a long that points to some location inside the segment. And then we have memory layouts, which are optional description of the contents of memory. You can decide to use them, or you can just decide to ignore them. But we, we will see what are the advantages of attaching a memory layout to a segment. The, if you look to the, in the Java doc of this API, you will find no method called get int or put int, uh, nothing of the kind. And we have received some question when uh, the request for review went out. It's not an omission uh, because we forgot about them. It's because uh, uh, there are plenty of ways in order to get to the data of a memory segment. You can, for example, take a memory segment and map it, it uh, to a byte buffer. And then you can use the old good byte buffer API to get int and floats and longs and uh, never look back at segments uh, ever again. Or if you, are, uh, uh, if you want to reach lower level and you want to go down the varendo rabbit hole, you can actually create varendos that are able to dereference memory using memory addresses. 
And uh, this is actually a good option that I will explore uh, in the final part of uh, this talk. So the, the main idea here is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to add a lot of accessor uh, for our memory. We can just uh, leverage the good APIs that we already have. This is what a segment looks like. Let's imagine that we have a, an array of struct point where a point has two int coordinates. It's a very simple thing. So we can imagine this array memory to be flattened so that all the coordinates are essentially consecutive. So x0, y0 up to x4, y4. This segment will have a natural uh, spatial bounds. So we will start from a base address, which is the which will point to x0, and then uh, we will have a limit address, which is the maximum address associated with this segment. Actually, it's the, the address of the first byte that is outside the segment. So as long as the access occurs within the segment, everything is fine. If I have an address, I can add an offset to it and obtain a new address. Uh, so, for example, if I add 16 to the, to the base address, I will obtain a new address that instead of pointing to x0, will point to x2. <coughs> and if I have a segment, I can also slice it. This is similar to the slice operation that my buffer also provides. So I can specify a new start address and a new length, and I will get a sub-segment which will be contained into the original segment. So nothing too fancy here. The, the main thing may, maybe to notice here is that this API is immutable. So there are no, none of these bounds that you see here are, are mutable. You, wh whenever a new address is created, you actually create a new instance with a new offset. So nothing will actually uh, mutate in memory, which will hopefully enable for better situ optimization in the future. The goal of uh, the big goal of the segment API, uh, API and the big bet is that we want an API that is able to do deterministic allocation, which means whenever you are sure that your memory is no longer going to be used, you should be able to explicitly free it. And the way this is done is, is that uh, you, you essentially have a segment, you use it, and when you are done, you close the segment. Of course, with power comes responsibility. If you forget to close your segment and the segment goes out of scope, you have a memory leak, because now we have some memory of heap, and uh, that is not being clear. <coughs> to uh, help with that, memory segments implement the auto-closable interface, so you can use uh, memory segment with the try with the source construct. Hopefully, that will reduce the occurrences where these leaks will occur. Uh, other things we could do in order to improve on this is to do something similar to what Netty has done, which is to add a uh, debugging kind of uh, mode where we actually register a cleaner and we keep track of when uh, a segment goes out of scope uh, and uh, the close method is not being called on it. So the way you work with segment, as I said, you don't need to do a lot, uh, an awful lot. You can just allocate your segment of the right size. So here, if we want to allocate a segment that is big enough to contain our struct of point array, we have to well do a little bit of computation. There are four bytes for each int. There are two ints for each point, and then there are five points in the array. And then I can just derive a byte buffer from the segment, and then pretend that the segment doesn't even exist. I will just use the byte buffer API to put the int for the x coordinate and the y coordinate into a loop. And uh, then at the end of the try with resources, when I close the brace, a, clo a close operation will happen. The, the memory associated with the segment will actually be released. So did I gain anything by doing this round trip uh, between uh, memory segments and by buffer? Well, actually, I gained quite a bit, because uh, I got rid of that expensive allocate direct operation. The byte buffer that we are creating now is just a view of the memory of the segment. So it's a much cheaper operation to do. And uh, we also have a deterministic deallocation at the end. So we no longer have to, re to rely on the garbage collector to go in and free the memory. We can actually say when the memory needs to be freed. And so if you write this code, you will get the same performances that you could get with the benchmark that I showed you last that was using an unsafe method to clean the memory. Actually, this should go even faster, because you are paying a lot less for the first uh, allocation of memory with the memory segment of native. There are problems in this code, though. I'm not going to lie. Uh, for example, we have to uh, compute uh, the size of the memory that we want to allocate manually. Uh, 
And then there are all these offsets and the constants spread all over the code. And this is very fragile. If I change, for example, the coordinates from in to be longs, for example, probably on 64 machine, this example is no longer going to work. <coughs> so how can we make this code a little bit more robust? Well, our idea was to introduce, uh, to introduce an abstraction called memory layout. And the goal of this uh, abstraction is actually to be able to replace that comment and I showed in the previous slide, so this, this thing at the top, with an actual object creation. So you can actually create an object which specifies what is the layout of this uh, array of structs. The advantage of doing that is that once you have an object, you can derive all sorts of inf uh, important information out of it. So for example, how big is your layout? What are the alignment uh, of some of the components in, in the layout? And uh, since layout can uh, compose, so you can basically nest layouts inside other layouts, you can uh, use layout paths to ask uh, uh, tricky questions such as, what is the offset of the field uh, Y inside a point? Uh, which will be normally uh, have been a, an end written constant. And now you can actually ask the API for that. And you can imagine that when working with more complex tracts, will, this will actually be useful. So the big bet here is that by having more declarative code, there will be less places for bugs to hide. So this is how we model the point struct using a layout. So of course, we have to start from the outside. We create a sequence layout. We call it sequence layout. So you have to specify a size, which is 5 in this case. And then you have to specify what goes inside the sequence. In this case, we have a struct. So we just call memory layout of struct. And then we have to specify what are the field of the struct. And there are two ints, 32 bits. I'm assuming uh, the ints here are mapped to 32-bit value. And I can even attach names uh, to the fields so that then I can actually perform queries on, on this particular layout. So here I've done a little bit of a simplification. In reality, if you try it out on uh, the Java 14 code, uh, the constructor for the value bits will also take an endianness, because of course you have to specify whether you are big endian or little endian, but it didn't fit in the slide, so that, that's kind of what it is. So uh, let's say that we have this big layout here, which represents my uh, array, and I want to compute uh, the offset of the Y field inside a point. How can I do that? Well, there is an endy method inside a layout object, which is called offset without too much fantasy, maybe. Uh, you have to pass a path that uh, enable the method to find the field that you want to uh, get the offset for, starting from the outer layout. So here we are starting from the sequence layout. The first thing I have to do is to choose an element of the sequence. Let's say that we pick the element number 0, because that's the one with the least offset. And then inside the sequence, now I have to choose which of the two field structs I want uh, for computing the offset. In this case, I want the Y uh, uh, field. And so by doing this, I was able to specify a path from the sequence down to the Y field. And now I can ask for the offset. So as you can see, I have been able to obtain the offset without writing any number. I'm just essentially querying the API. And that's exactly what we are doing now in this written example. We got rid of the comment at the beginning of the example that we had uh, before. And we replaced it with an actual mm, memory layout instantiation. So now we have an object that describes the layout of the, thi of the things that we are going to work on. And then I, I'm able, in the middle part of the slide, to use the layout to derive constants, such as how big is a point, or what is the offset of the y uh, field inside the struct point. And then I can use all this stuff inside my loop to get rid of all the numeric constants. And mo most importantly, I can use the layout directly into the allocate call uh, for the memory segment, which means I don't have to write the size by end. I will just delegate to the layout API to do the right thing. So this is much easier to read. Uh, we gain quite a lot in terms of expressiveness. There is still a little bit, there is still something that I don't quite like, which is if we go inside uh, the loop, we see that there are two calls to the byte buffer put int method. It's pretty hard looking at this code that one call is meant to set one field of the struct and the other 
coal is meant to set a different field of the struct. It's only the offset computation that kind of gives away that information. So that's yet another place where bugs can hide. So can we do a little bit better? Can we improve a little bit on, on that? And the idea that we got, maybe a crazy idea, was to introduce a new breed of varandals uh, called memory access handles. For those of you who are not able or familiar, uh, sorry, not, not familiar with the, by, with the varandal API, you can think of a varandal as a Java Lang reflect field on steroids in the sense that a reflective field uh, gives you access to Java fields. A varandal gives you also access to reflective access to Java field, but also to more variables, such as uh, array elements or byte buffer elements. So it kind of felt natural to also provide a new varandal that was also able to give you access to, for example, off memory by taking as a coordinate a memory address. The big gain that you get with this API is that, number one, you get all the atomic operation that the Varendal API support. So let's say that the byte buffer API is not enough. You, you, you're not uh, good enough with just a, sing, a, a simple get. You want an atomic get or, or, or something like that. Or mem you want memory fencing because you're working with multiple threads. Then you need to reach for the Varendal API. That's, that's probably the, the best API to, to do this kind of stuff with. And the second bonus point is that if you are using memory layouts, you don't have to do anything particularly fancy in order to get this varandal. You can just ask the layout API, give me the varandal for accessing that field, and you will basically get it. So if we want to see how this varandal work, there is a factory inside the memory access API that allows you to construct the varandals by end. Typically, you won't have to do that because, as I said before, you will derive the varandals from the layouts. But let's say that you want to kind of go through the process and create the varandals uh, bit by bit. So when you create a memory access varandal, the first thing that you have to specify is a carrier type. So you have to say to the varandal, what is the Java type that you want to come out of, for example, of a get operation? So in this case, we want to read the, the value as int because the value are for bytes. So we are going to pass the int dot class. Uh, to the varandal factory. And so we get a varandal that, uh, for example, if I give the base address of this segment, it will, it will give me back the value of the x0 coordinate. Can I do more? Yes, of course. If I want, for example, to read y0 rather than x0, I can combine my previous varandal with an offset. So I can essentially take the address that comes in, attach an extra offset to it, move it, and then read at the second address. And so I can read y0. If I pass the base address, I can get y0 out. But can I do something more fancy? Like, can I access all the y coordinates in this array? Actually, it turns out I can. I can construct a strided varandal. So I can pass in the stride. In this case, the stride is, of course, the size of the point. And so I get back a varandal that takes an extra coordinate, not just a memory address, but also a long, where the long is a logical index, which, is, which basically says which point uh, I want to get the y from. So if I do, for example, uh, a get uh, with an index of 0, I will get y0. If I specify 1 as an index, I will get y, y1, and so forth. Now, constructing varandals like that may be a little bit painful. So we integrated this varandal machinery with the memory layout API. So as you can see in the middle sequence of this slide, we can actually derive all the varandal for accessing x and y with two simple calls to the layout API. There is a varandal method. You specify a carrier type. Then you specify a path down to the element that you want to access. And so you can construct in two lines a varandal for the x element, a varandal for the y element. And now inside the loop, you can see that I'm using the x varandal for setting the x elements and the y varandal for accessing the y elements. So now the code is more explicit. And if I change anything in the layout up there, everything will just flow. So I won't need to update this code uh, at the bottom ever again, hopefully. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about safety. As I said at the beginning, this is a safe API. So one of the main goal is uh, to avoid any kind of VM crashes. It is beyond the scope of this API to avoid uh, kind of silly user mistakes, such as uh, writing an int, and maybe re reading the four byte value as a float. That's not something we want to protect you against. Uh, 
But for example, there are a couple of conditions that we want to protect you against, such as accessing memory out of bounds, which if the memory is of heap can result in a crash, and also accessing memory after the memory has already been freed. The second problem is in particular na a nasty one, especially when you consider multiple threads accessing memory at the same time, because you can have one thread uh, doing access and another thread doing the release. So how the heck do we make this safe? It's actually uh, pretty tricky. You could lock everything, but that basically kills the performances. Instead, what we decided to do was to, uh, by default, enforce a strong confinement model so that whenever you create a segment, the segment is confined to that particular thread who created it. So only the thread has access to the memory associated with the segment. Any other thread that want to join in can, but it has to do a, an explicit operation called acquire. This acquire will, call, will create a view that is specific to that second thread. And uh, you can only close the original segment after all the acquired views have gone. So we still have deterministic deallocation, even in the presence of multiple threads. But if you are working with multiple threads, you have to be explicit on who is accessing what. So how does this translate in terms of performances? This was the best result we could squeeze out of the byte buffer API. We had to cheat a little bit by using unsafe. And this is our, these are the numbers that are coming today uh, out of the memory segment API. Uh, they are still not as good as the unsafe numbers, but they are a little bit better than the byte buffer ones. The main contributor, I think, for this number is the fact that the allocation got a lot uh, less expensive compared to the byte buffer allocate direct uh, method. But there are also other things. So all the bounds are final variables, so C2 can hoist them uh, uh, at will, almost. Um, and there is still a little bit of a difference. Also, we have to keep in mind that uh, we are also zero in memory with the memory segment API. So we can never go quite as fast as unsafe here. But we are also kind of trying to look ahead a little bit. And we, are, um, we don't want just to provide you something that looks a little bit better than byte buffer. We want to give you something that is actually more scalable, as I was mentioning at the beginning. So we are working on a different allocator. Jim Lasky is doing a bunch of work on this new allocator called the quota-based allocator. And the numbers so far, I'm kind of teasing you a little bit, are pretty impressive in the sense that uh, after I did some experiment, experiment to plug in this new allocator on the memory segment API, uh, I was able to reach better performances than unsafe, even though I was still zeroing memory. So this allocator is doing a lot of the tricks that the Netty allocator probably does. But there are a couple of tricks that I think are new. So for example, we instead of uh, committing memory eagerly, we pre-reserve a big bunch of memory, like 4 gigabytes. And then we only commit when the client requests memory. And doing this saves uh, performances quite a bit. But the big save is that we don't need a native call for doing uh, a malloc each time we allocate a new segment or each time we have to free it because uh, the allocator will be able to recycle these memory segments that uh, are being handed out and released. So this is kind of where the future of this API is kind of heading. And I think if we deliver something like this, maybe, or at least hopefully, some of the alternative API to byte buffer will over time disappear. Or maybe people that are going to write new API will decide to stay on the main JDK API. How hard was it to get there? Well, I'm going to be honest, it was a little bit hard. Uh, Andrew did uh, <laughs> some benchmark of this API and found some issues. There are indeed some issues. We fixed some of the stuff on, in uh, Java 14 already. So for example, uh, Hotspot was very conservative with respect to memory barriers. Every time there was an unsafe access, it will immediately add barriers uh, after the call. Uh, now, C2 is, uh, go, is, is uh, behaving a little bit better, and it's uh, removing barriers when the access is probably off heap. And this also improved the performance of the base by buffer API. So that, that's actually a good result. Thread confinement checks were not very well treated by C2, uh, most of all because the thread.current thread was not being uh, perceived as a constant by C2. So we did some work, Vlad did some work in order to 
to, 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 to fix that and now performances are a little bit better although we have to disable this optimization for on the loom uh, branch because this of course creates all sorts of havocs with, uh, with fibers uh, but we are not done there are a lot of issues around uh, escape analysis this API as I said is immutable every time you call base address you create a new instance every time you do add offset on an address you create a new instance and sometimes these instances go in the middle and uh, perturb some of the situ optimization that situ is not so able to kind of see through some of the allocations there is also another problem and this is probably the main problem with this api this api accept long as indices and this is good because it gives more uh, room uh, for this API to grow, but at the same time, we are running into some bottlenecks with C2 in the sense that uh, C2 is optimized uh, to remove bound checks on loops that work on int. So as, uh, as soon as you step out of ints, you are into a heap of trouble. And uh, the bound check elimination no longer work, uh, loops are no longer unrolled, you don't get vectorization, any of that. So right now we are doing some heroics uh, in order to try to kind of generate the right set of code, but uh, we think that the right uh, approach longer term will be to fix this big uh, performance gap and at least uh, let uh, C2 to see whether a segment is bigger than two gigabytes or not. And if it is not, then revert to the logic and optimization that we already have. In, in other words, there's more work here to be had. So I think the memory access API is a great alternative to the by buffer API or a great complement. Uh, it is a fully uh, immutable API, so it should lend over time to better uh, JIT optimization. Uh, there is deterministic allocation that you didn't have with by buffer, and that makes quite a difference in terms of GC load. Uh, the, addressing limited, uh, the addressing scheme is not limited to two gigabyte, which also makes a difference if you are using persistent memories or things like that. And there, are, there, there is the availability for doing structural access with the varandals, memory layouts. So I think it's a very uh, compelling alternative to by buffer if what you want to do is, is uh, off heap. Uh, the memory access API is safe. Uh, it's a safe by buffer, so it's a good uh, safe replacement to, for, for the unsafe API. There are spatial and temporal checks on every access, and there is a robust ownership model which allows you to remain safe even if you are working on multiple threads and still retain the, the, the deterministic allocation. So where does all it fit in the bigger Panama picture. Uh, I'm not going to talk about JNI, but I just wanted to give you uh, a, a taste of kind of where, where it all uh, fits together. So uh, as Mark showed earlier, we want to, in Panama, we want to give you tools so that you can start from an ender file, do some work, and derive a set of Java bindings. And these Java bindings, initially we thought, well, maybe they are interfaces with some annotation, and then there will be a runtime component that reads the annotation and will generate some code on the fly. We actually realized that there's no need for that. Uh, we only needed two pieces. One is the memory, I, uh, mem memory access API piece, which gives you a bunch of varandals for accessing the memory, uh, the, for example, struct fields at particular offset and things like that. The second bit is a foreign function uh, uh, API bit, which we are going probably to deliver in 15 also as an incubating API, which uh, allows you to map foreign function as method handles. On top of these two bits, you are able to create a very low level set of bindings, and then you can also build on top of those. If you want, you can add the plugins to the basic tool that we will provide and generate higher level bindings. But the low level bindings, as uh, Mark showed before, are not so bad. We are generating static wrappers, so they are relatively usable. So uh, as I said at the beginning of this talk, this API is actually available in Java 14. So my recommendation is to kind of try it out and report back performance portals or usability issues or whatever you can find. Uh, next steps, of course, are to round up the performance work. We know that we have to do better here. Uh, we want also to finish the work on the allocator because we think there's a lot of room for improvement there. And we have to polish and finalize the API. Right now it's an incubating API. There are probably methods that need to be polished or named or whatever. And then we have to integrate this API into the overarching Panama story.
So you can follow the progress on Panama Dev, but if you are more familiar with Core Libs, you can also report the issues on Core Libs. I will be looking for both. So thank you.